everyone, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. During that time, if you'd like to ask a question, you may press star 1. I'd like to inform all parties that today's call will be recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to turn the call over to your host, Ms. Sarah Fraser. You may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for today's media briefing. I'm Sarah Frazier with NASA's Office of Communications. Last week, NASA and United Launch Alliance demonstrated the largest ever inflatable heat shield, lofted, short for Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable Decelerator, launched on a ULA Atlas V with NOAA's JPSS-2 weather and climate satellite. After JPSS-2 separated, lofted, inflated, deployed, and re-entered Earth's atmosphere, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean about two hours after launch. Over the past week, team members have started the process of inspecting lofted and getting the heat shield and, the heat shield and its data back to NASA's Langley Research Center for study. Full study of lofted's performance is expected to take about a year, but today we're going to hear from a few of the team members about how the demo went and what they have learned so far. So here to talk about these early results, are Trudy Cordes, Director of Technology Demonstrations in the Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, Joe Del Corso, Lofted Project Manager from NASA's Langley Research Center, John Donano, Lofted's Chief Engineer from NASA Langley, and Greg Swanson, Lofted's in Instrumentation Lead from NASA's Ames Research Center. Also on the line is RJ Bodkin from the Lofted team to help answer questions. So we'll start with some brief remarks from our speakers and then open it up for questions. As Becca said, to ask a question, you'll dial star 1 on your phone. Uh, and just a reminder that the call is also being streamed on NASA.gov. So our speakers are going to reference some images. Um, if you are a CP, you should have gotten the link in your inbox to these images. The link is also posted on NASA.gov slash live. If you scroll down to where this call is embedded, just above that, there's a link to the web page with those images. All right, so with that, I am going to pass it over to Trudy Cordes to get us started. Okay, um, thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone, and, and, and welcome to the, the audio, audio, audio conference today um, in what seems like a series of, of briefings we've had for, for you all. So thanks for your continued interest in, in our demonstration, our lofted demonstration. And I'll just start out by saying it's been a really exciting week for NASA, for the agency. Um, and you know we haven't we haven't had just one flight test in the past week. We we've had two. One is still in process, but um, to to have that in common with Artemis is pretty cool. Lost and, and Artemis uh, launching in the same week. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to say that. Um, you know, in technology demonstrations, we mature um, we mature technologies uh, that are in the higher TRL technology readiness level uh, regime. These are cross-cutting technologies with multiple applications. We certainly have that here in the case of Lofted with both uh, commercial and government applications for what we're developing. Uh, we do things at a system level. We put um, components and subsystems together at a larger um, a system level uh, to demonstrate them in relevant environments in which they need to ultimately operate. So these are risk reduction activities, and it's a way for us to develop new capabilities as an overall objective um, and in this case, to meet the agency's future mission needs for uh, future um, Mars exploration, uh, landing large-scale cargo or humans um, on, on surfaces uh, through atmospheres. Um, and so that's our overall objective, specifically with, with something like a technology demonstration. The basic question we're always looking to answer is, is does it work? Um, does this work at a system level in that environment? And I think last week with Lawson, we got that answer. Um, and it looked to be a pretty resounding yes. Um, so, you know, we, we launched last week out of Vandenberg. And, and I don't know if any of you line, online had a chance to, to watch. It was a really cool experience for us. We had folks on both coasts, the project team and others out at Vandenberg to see the launch. And then some of us were congregated at Langley Research Center, which led this project for us. Um, so we were in Virginia, um, had a watch party, and, and watched it live on NASA TV. And, and I'll just say I knew this was going to play out as program director in that way where it would be a joint with JPSS2 uh, on NASA, the NASA broadcast. And yet I was still in absolute awe to see it um, 
it all play out on NASA TV and to even have them um, stay on with us for an extra about 45 minutes uh, while they, they recovered the test article in, in the Pacific Ocean. And, and speaking of that, um, an image uh, that I would point you to is um, image one in, on the web page that you've been um, supplied that the link to, and that's a splashdown. Um, so you kind of see a, a glowing round article off on, on in the distance um, coming down into the water. Um, so that's a particularly uh, cool video. So I would say last week, um, uh, you're going to hear from our three experts today on the preliminary results. Um, but last week, I thought was a, just a banner day for uh, this particular project um, for Langley Research Center, uh, for United Launch, Launch Alliance, our partner, um, all of the, all of the um, participating organizations, this, and then Space Technology Mission Director could not have been more proud last week. Um, at the execution of this project. So, you know, we look forward just to the results, both the initial look at this that you're going to hear about today, and then the, the long-term or future detailed report that we're going to get um, to this in, in some months' time. So um, those are my opening remarks, and um, thanks, Sarah. Back to you. Thank you, Trudy. All right, next we'll hear from Joe Del Corso, Lofted's Project Manager. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate being on. And uh, welcome to everybody, and um, I, I agree with what Trudy said. NASA has had just a spectacular couple of weeks with JPSS-2 being on orbit, uh, lofted success, and then following that up with that, that little rocket some of you might have seen off the East Coast, Artemis-1. Um, now, today I'm, I'm going to talk to lofted uh, first, and then I'd like to explain uh, some of the larger context for why all these successes are so important, not just to NASA, but to the nation. So lofted, as, as Sarah mentioned before, is the low-Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, and that's an orbital entry demonstration, and which is what we did. We demonstrated orbital entry of the HIAD technology, that is the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator technology. For anyone who still doesn't know what HIAD is, it's a deployable aeroshell that's stowed for launch and during cruise, then deployed in orbit prior to atmospheric entry in order to decelerate payloads at destinations with an atmosphere. So um, Lofted was flown as a secondary payload on the Atlas V launch vehicle. Um, after the Centaur, the second stage of the Atlas vehicle, delivered JPSS-2 to Earth orbit, the Centaur stage then uh, fired deorbit motors uh, and began deorbiting the Lofted vehicle. If you look at uh, the images on number two, I believe they're, they're referenced, you'll see some of the uh, activities that were uh, we were able to see uh, shortly after downloading all the video of, of the aeroshell inflating. So the Centaur second stage deorbit the lofted vehicle, turned the vehicle on, inflated it, inflated the aeroshell, and then released the lofted reentry vehicle. Lofted entered the Earth's atmosphere at eight kilometers per second, which is uh, right on point with what we were expecting. Um, and we were able to track the RV, the reentry vehicle, all the way through splash from both ground and aerial aspects. So <clears throat> both John and, and Greg are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, while we're still currently in the process of downloading all of the sensor data, uh, you know, converting it to usable in information and engineering units, uh, as well as the visual and the IR videos, uh, we can safely say that based on the recovery of the RV, some of our quick look data and uh, the, stat the state of the aeroshell uh, and, and the information that we do have, that the demonstration was a huge success. Now, putting all this into larger context, with the success of Artemis I, NASA has now demonstrated the United States' new heavy up-mass capability. In order to put people into space on the moon or send them to Mars, we need stuff, lots of it, which means we need to put a lot of mass into space. NASA has now demonstrated that we have the capability to put heavy payloads into space. On the, on the flip side, with the success of Lofted, we have now demonstrated the HIAD technology. In other words, NASA has demonstrated the United States' new heavy down-mass capability. We have now the ability to both put heavy payloads into space and to bring them back down. These two successes are huge steps in enabling human access and exploration. We're going to space, and we want to be able to stay there. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Joe. All right, I'm going to pass it next to John Donano, who is Lofted's chief engineer. 
Okay, hello. Welcome, everyone. I uh, couldn't be happier with the way this mission went and with what we're seeing so far. Um, we are all eager to get the data, uh, all of the data, the comprehensive set of data off of the vehicle, and we're in the process of doing that, but that process will take a considerable amount of time. Um, so I'm going to speak to what we have seen so far and what we can, what we have learned from it. Um, so we had the data from the Centaur, and that revealed that our trajectory was spot on. We were delivered right on target at the proper entry orientation, the proper speed and flight path angle. We uh, saw the initial external infrared imaging uh, that was referred to in image one, um, and it did the heating on the outside of the air shell looked uniform and did not reveal uh, high heating concentrations from what we could see in that video. And that suggests a uh, good uniform performance. Uh, the outside of the aeroshell, when we recovered it, looked absolutely pristine. Uh, the aeroshell and the center body, uh, you would not know that they had been through a uh, very intense uh, reentry pulse. Um, it was well protected by the heat shield, and it looks as if the inflatable structure could fly again. Um, the forward side looked nearly pristine as well. Uh, it did sustain some damage, but nearly all the damage on the forward surface of the air shell appeared to be caused by a splashdown and time in the ocean, uh, things that it wasn't really designed for. Um, the process of pulling it out of the ocean and setting it onto the fixture, uh, it sustained some mechanical damage that way. But the, uh, we did not see damage from heating or from flight on the, uh, on the air shell at all. Um, we saw some minor uh, markings on it that suggest the... Uh, some streamlined flows, uh, but nothing that actually would uh, come close to penetrating through the, the protection, protective layers. Um, the water, it had made the forward layers heavy and applied loads in the opposite direction for the intended design uh, in flight. So uh, this damage wasn't surprising and, and we knew that risk going in, um, that it could, sustain, that it could sustain, sustain much more damage than we actually observed. So uh, we're very happy with the uh, with the resulting vehicle that we retrieved from the recovery ship. And Greg will speak to uh, some of the processing on that uh, after we recovered it. Um, we did download video data from the Uplook camera, and those, if you look in the, uh, in the packet online, uh, that would be item number five, which is the, uh, that's, that's the, that's the money shot for us. <laughs> the, uh, the view of the reentry plasma is, uh, it, it was incredible to watch. Um, and the, uh, and item six shows how stable we were with the uh, descent and the parachute deployment. Um, so this uplift camera is a camera at the aft end of the vehicle, looking up behind the vehicle through a protective window. And, uh, it showed terrific images of the clean separation from the centaur. And we could observe the Centaur uh, doing a collision avoidance maneuvers as we drifted away from it. And then it gave us uh, these amazing images of the plasma wake behind the vehicle. Um, it first begins as a, you know, glowing softly uh, orange, and then it becomes much brighter. And you see the wake field converge towards the center well behind the vehicle. And this convergence stayed remarkably well centered in the, uh, in the camera view and uh, this reveals qualitatively that the vehicle is very stable. Uh, the orange color then transitions to an intense blue color from the heating and the plume you'll see uh, includes an axisymmetric pattern, kind of like spokes on a wheel that uh, coincide with physical features on the aeroshell um, and all that looks nominal. The uh, And then we also found that, you know, in the, in the the video uh, number six, the descent and parachute deploy, that the moon happened to be framed nicely in the middle of the window. And that stayed there throughout its descent through uh, transonic and subsonic flight, uh, proving that the vehicle is very stable uh, in all regimes. And that was a, that was a, a wonderful thing to demonstrate. Um, it's hard to get that uh, completely demonstrated in on the ground. And uh, so this, this flight, um, proved a lot of people right. Uh, so the upload camera saw the parachute deploy uh, in darkness, but we're working on ways to enhance that and see it a little bit better uh, from the images it captured. 
and it was picture perfect all the way down to the splash down. Um, so the, uh, I guess the, the, the natural question is what's next? Um, we, we've seen, you know, some very successful mission here, uh, but we still have a tremendous amount of data to work through and to process. Um, we extracted the internal data recorder from the vehicle and we retrieved the ejected data recorder from the ocean. And so uh, we now have to go through the comprehensive data that was recorded on board. And this includes uh, thermocouples, pressure transducers, heat flux gauges, load cells. The inertial measurement unit is a big one that will help us with the reconstruction of the flight. Uh, fiber optic sen sensing system. Uh, this is its first flight and uh, we're hoping to get um, a good map of temperatures in different locations. Uh, GPS data, we have avionics housekeeping data on board, and uh, obviously we have the, the video and the infrared cameras um, that will help us with the, the onboard imaging, along with some external imaging data from the SciFly team uh, that uh, were airborne and tracked the uh, reentry of the vehicle uh, coming in, and so they got the uh, performing the side fly lofted imaging mission. Uh, we're able to capture that. So uh, we do have the data downloaded from the data recorders, and it's being processed now. But it, it will take some time to go through it all and make it usable. And uh, we extracted the single board computers from the camera pods. Uh, they were physically extracted from the vehicle and have been sent. Uh, back to Langley, and they are being processed for uh, eventually getting higher definition images from the onboard uh, cameras. And we will be using all this data to assess the uh, reconstructed trajectory. Um, we'll be correlating our uh, CFD or computational fluid dynamics uh, entry environments. Um, we will be uh, examining the, the inflation system performance, the structural performance of the aeroshell itself with the internal pressures and load cells uh, against those applied environments. And of course, the thermal response performance, which is uh, one of the major items we want to get from this. Uh, so that's all I have for where we are right now. And I'll pass it back to Sarah. Thanks, John. OK, next we will hand it over to Greg Swanson, Lofted's instrumentation lead. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, so, as everybody was sitting at Vandenberg for the launch and the rest of the team was sitting at Langley for the, uh, for all the festivities, we, a small team of us, were out on the Kahana 2 uh, vessel out about 500 miles off the coast of Hawaii waiting in the recovery zone uh, to get, to be able to uh, recover the article and injectable data recorder after splashdown. Um, so, we got out there about two hours before a launch and started doing preparations to recover the RV. The goal was to go get the RV first um, because that was not designed to float, um, whereas our injectable data recorder was. So we uh, first positioned ourselves in a good place to uh, recover the re-entry vehicle. Um, had a lot of excitement on board when we started getting the data packets and then, of course, the IR imagery that Trudy pointed to in the beginning, um, that was, you know, amazing to see the thing come down uh, under parachute and splash down. Um, and once it was splashed down, uh, we actually could see it with the naked eye, um, the lights on the vehicle. And so we were able to really easily point the recovery vessel, the Kana 2, towards the um, reentry vehicle and ahead that way. It was about, it was less than five miles away, so it took us about 40 minutes to get there. Um, as we were getting there, we were getting everything prepped and ready to get in the water. Uh, so we put the, uh, on the big recovery vessel, there was also a small boat, a seven meter boat that we uh, put into the water using the, the large boat's crane. Um, and a small group of us, three of us from the lofted team and one crew member from the boat headed out on that small boat um, and pulled up to uh, the recovery or the re-entry vehicle, which I have to say was one of the most amazing things I've ever done in my life. I mean, pulling up to see something that, we worked on for all these years, just floating there high in the water, no water in the basket. It looked pristine, like it hadn't even flown through space. I mean, that was that was truly amazing. Um, so once we got to it, uh, we pulled up next to it. And we were able to hold on to it. Actually, if you go to video number eight, 
Um, that's a, a quick video of a camera I was wearing on my head. You can see me actually holding on to the vehicle. As Steve Hughes, the aero show lead, is uh, prepping the parachute legs. Uh, we had a um, we had the parachute was designed to once it hit the water to release the actual canopy, and so we had the legs left, and that's what we were able to use to lift it onto the recovery ship. So Steve Hughes is putting the shackles on the, those recovery legs and then getting it ready. And so once we had all of it rigged up, we were able to attach uh, the lifting point to the sh big ship's crane, and they were able to get it on to the recovery vessel and in the uh, stand that we had created to uh, bring it home on the boat. Uh, after that, it was still dark. That whole process took a couple hours. Um, we waited until daylight uh, to go after the ejectable data recorder. That's the, our little um, data module that is about the size of a large lemon. It's also painted yellow, so lemon's a good analogy there. Um, so, But uh, there's no lights or anything besides it's sending us its coordinates, but besides that, we have no way easily to see it without just spotting it in the water, so we wanted to wait till daylight. So once it, uh, the sun rose, we went after that, and uh, after a few passes, got that on board and uh, headed back to port. Uh, now that we're back in port, uh, you can see if you go to video nine, that's a time lapse of some of the activities we're doing. And it starts with us lifting the RV off the Kahana 2, and we placed it over uh, near University of Hawaii's Marine Center uh, warehouse, where we've been uh, working on it and inspecting it. You can see. Um, in that video, we start. We the first thing we do is we did some inspection, and then we deflated it. Um, and once we got it all the way deflated, we were able to go in and remove the panels, remove the system batteries, and the internal data recorder. Uh, and it was great to get all that out. Once that was done, we uh, lifted it and put it on its side. Um, you'll see that in the time lapse as well. And uh, we were able to pull then all the the camera single board computers that John talked about and the upload camera footage. And that's when we first got to see that, which was also amazing. Um, after that, we uh, put it nose up and reinflated it. And we did one final inspection, a detailed photo survey of both the board and aft side of the vehicle. And uh, yesterday we deflated it one final time. And this morning we got it all wrapped up and packaged and shipped and ready to ship back to Langley. And, uh, that's where we're at, so I'll give it back to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Greg. All right, so that is all of our speakers, so we are now going to start the Q&A portion. Um, so as the operator told you, when you're ready to ask a question, if you press star one on your phone, that will put you into the queue. And when you do ask your question, please state your name, your affiliation, and to whom you're directing the question, if it is for a specific person. All right. I think we are ready to start the Q&A, so um, I will let Becca um, call on the first person. Our first question comes from David Curley. Your line is not open. You may ask your question. Thanks very much. I guess this is for Joe. Um, you suggested that maybe the inflatable part uh, could be reused, reused again. I've never heard that uh, that's a possibility. Are you now considering it, or was that always part of the plan. Um, by the way, congratulations. Uh, you all sound <laughs> extremely excited. And Joe, I, I, I think you, you said it, um, the breakthrough that this really is, that I'm not sure how much attention it's gotten across uh, the industry. Um, and what does ULA have to say? Thank you. So, oh, thank you. Um, so, so as far as uh, the first question, Dave, um, thank you for, for the congratulations. I, I really, what I typically do is I point to the team. I say, look, this team has been spectacular. They've done a great job. So um, we're all extremely excited. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, the, the, the breakthrough in the, of the technology itself, um, ULA is very excited. Um, we've, we've already got um, Space Act agreement in place or, or about to be in place. We're working on final signatures now uh, for their smart reuse. They have clearly been very excited. Um, they want to utilize this for, as part of um, their engine recovery operations. So, um, you know, we were standing there in the LBDC-1 um, as we were seeing the vehicle Flash down, and John Reed, their chief, um, their chief engineer, uh, 
chief rocket scientist um, <clears throat> was calling into their their the ULA folks and, and saying, you know, hey, this is a spectacular success. So all in all, everybody is incredibly excited. As far as reuse of the inflatable structure, um, we're really designing these as single use, but um, we have looked at dual use, such as aero capture to entry. Um, we, we just haven't validated a dual use application yet at this point. Um, while the while the aeroshell is pristine and beautiful, we've got some work to do to, to really analyze to make sure that hey, does this would this work in a dual use uh, capability uh, situation? Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Faust. Your line is not open. Hey, good afternoon. A question probably for Trudy. What is the next step in testing this technology once you're done analyzing the data from Lofted? Um, is NASA planning to, to scale up and test larger uh, inflatable decelerators or hand this technology over to industry for further development? Thanks. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Thanks for the question. And, and uh, the other folks online might want to jump in as well. But yeah, so. So, you know, at the agency level, we have roadmaps for each of the um, capability areas that we're uh, um, developing, and this is in the entry, descent, and landing category, as you know. And, um, yes, you're right, scale-up would be a next um, step for us. You know, the agency for its um, future Mars missions is talking about, um, it, you know, it hasn't been finalized, but is talking about um, scale-up uh, of this technology in the, you know, like 18 meter range, 18 to 20 ish uh, uh, meter range. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done with that. There are um, there are facility considerations with that that need to be looked at. Um, but the roadmap will guide us on that in our invest the future investments in that, and and we're taking a look at that now, and and will in the the short term um, uh, future for that. Um, and uh, and and so so yeah, that would be next. Um, uh, for this capability. I don't know if anyone else online wants to, to uh, add anything else to that response. Yeah, yeah this, this is John. One. I can add to that. Um, nope. So the, thank you, Joe, sorry. Um, this is the largest blunt body that has ever re-entered the atmosphere. Uh, so this, you know, we, we made this about as large as you possibly could for the uh, constraints that we had as a secondary payload. Uh, inside the atlas um we are uh but yeah the, the next step is to scale up even beyond this and and uh we'll need to for the uh vulcan injury engine recovery and certainly for missions to mars uh but this six meter diameter was uh, a really large step um from what had been demonstrated before and nothing had been demonstrated at the system at this uh level of energy from orbit uh so this was a good, uh, a, a very good, unique uh, stepping stone in that process to uh, demonstrate a very uh, mission applicable uh, environment that is, uh, it is an example of what we would do for Mars missions or robotic missions, even at this scale. Uh, but we do have uh, a lot of work to do going forward as well for all the applications we have in mind. And just to, to chime in real quick, um, this is not a, a you know NASA or industry. This is really both NASA and industry moving forward. Uh, industry has applications for the use of the technology. NASA, as Trudy mentioned, has roadmap for use in the, of this technology for scale up and uh, eventual use at, at Mars or and even and even more in the near term for, for Earth entry as well. So this is not an either or, it's definitely an and. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Kenneth Chang. Your line is not open. Hi, thank you. So I'm wondering if the analysis possible and everything worked as well as you think it does, what would the TR level be? And is it ready to actually be incorporated in NASA submissions? Um, I was thinking you know, it would be really useful, for instance, on Mars for return where it's been, you know, the current technology is sort of at the limit of what the mission is at. 
Thank you. So, Trudy, do you want to you want to answer this one, or you want me to take a shot? Uh, you can take a shot, Joe. I, I'm sorry, the speaker was breaking up quite a bit for me. I'm not I'm not sure I heard the entire part of the last part of the question, but yeah, Joe, if you want to start. Okay. So, so what I what I the question that I heard is what what TRL do we think we're at? What technology readiness level do we think we're at? Um, you know, with the success of, of Lofted, um, I would put us you know firmly at TRL seven at this point. Um, we, we do still have a lot of work to do when it comes to scale up, and so we'll have to continue to, to, to do some, some um, ground activities as well as um, flight demonstrations just to show uh, some of the capability at, at larger scale. But a lot of that work has already started and was started under the hi 2 ground development effort uh, when we scaled up to uh, 12 and 12 to uh, 16 meter scale, um, and we demonstrated that we had the capability to build to that. Now, um, there's still a lot of work that has to be done, uh, but you know, just kind of you know, throwing, you know, squinting my eyes and blurring my eyes and, and putting my thumb out there, I would say we're right around TRL seven. Yeah, thanks. I, I didn't hear all your questions, but thanks for that, Joe. I would answer the same way with the TRL level and. I think the second half might have been something about is it ready to be incorporated um, into NASA missions? Certainly, if there are NASA missions that can use this, you know, the scale. But you know, we have to remember this is a, a it's a learning for us. This is a flight test. Um, you know, we we have to take some time to really understand um, what the hardware experience and um, kind of wait for the. Uh, the team to do its forensics on this and and do their data reduction and um, and issue the report on this uh, before we can really figure out the go forward plan here. So it's a it's a great step, but we do have some work to do in the coming year to um, uh, uh, to be able to look at all this and um, and 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 learn from it. Our next question comes from Marcia Smith. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd like to follow up on Ken's question. I think he was asking uh, specifically if you might use this on Mars sample return. And I think more broadly, I don't think I've heard how much mass you could land on Mars with a six meter diameter shell. So in terms of what's the next step and scaling it up, the 20 ton limit that I've heard before about how much is needed if you're going to be landing humans on Mars that, you know, does a six meter do it for humans or do you need to scale up to 18 meters? Just how far does this get you in terms of utilization on Mars? And a second question unrelated to that is, was it something special about launching this out of the West coast? Can this be launched from either coast? John, do you want to do you want to take the yeah. mass? Uh, yeah. So this is this is John Donato. Um, regarding the mass at Mars for a six meter, uh, I don't have those numbers directly in front of me. Uh, I would think it'd be somewhere on the order of two tons. Um, regarding the uh, launching on any coast, uh, yes, we could. We the reason we were on the west coast this time was. Uh, only because of the ride share that we were on and they were going on a polar orbit. So that's why they launched out of the West coast. Uh, we could, uh, you know, we stow in a vehicle and can launch anywhere as long as, uh, we get our flight path correct for the re-entry. And, and how much would you need to uh, land humans on Mars? What, what diameter aeroshell? I think Trudy was speaking to that. Um, that's on the order of 18 to 20 meters. Yeah, you know, I've I've heard um, I've heard numbers from our um, uh, our counterparts in exploration systems in the range of uh, gosh, 18 to 22 meter diameter uh, high ads. And um, you might not want to quote me on that. Maybe 18 to 24, but it's in that realm of probably scaling this up times three. Is is Three to four is what I would guess. Yeah. And the question about using it on Mars sample return? 
Yeah, we have not had those discussions with Science Mission Directorate um, at, at this point. Uh, so th that is not um, a discussion that's taken place yet uh, with, with those, with our colleagues in SMD. Thanks so much. All right, just a reminder, this is Sarah again. If you want to ask a question, please press star 1 to get in the queue. I don't think we have any more questions at the moment, so I'm going to ask one of my questions. Um, and this is for anyone who wants to answer. Can you tell us something about what was, what was surprising about the flight demo? Was there anything that was unexpected for you? Uh, this is John. I'll go ahead and try since uh, no one jumped in. Um, for me, I was pleasantly surprised with how nominal the flight was. We had prepared for, you know, dispersion in the trajectory, and everything was right down the middle to the point where we could see the article coming down under shoot from the ship. Uh, I was not expecting that. I didn't want to allow myself to expect that. <laughs> As engineers, we're always... Uh, trying to think of how things might go wrong and how we mitigate against those. And so uh, you don't get uh, comfortable uh, assuming a nominal flight, uh, but I was surprised by how nominal it was. It was right down the middle. And I would just say, um, Sarah, from uh, just a, you know, a casual viewer, which I was, I was that night watching on NASA, uh, the NASA broadcast with a, a lot of other people, I was surprised at how um, uh, the proximity in which the uh, the test article uh, landed uh, with um, respect to the recovery vessel that that did surprise me uh, somewhat. I did know that the recovery was vessel was within the ellipse of the the landing ellipse, but still how how close uh, it landed was um, was surprising to me, and I think probably speaks to our expertise in trajectory analysis and, and those folks who, who do those things. So that was, that was great. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say uh, from my perspective, just seeing the article, you know, post flight, I, we, we had a lot of preconceived notions going in. Um, when you, when you look at the data for long periods of time and you look at the, at, at the expected, you know, heating environments and, and entry environments. And, and as John said, you plan for all the dispersions. You, you kind of get sidetracked in some ways. So when the vehicle came in and we looked at it, we I, I expected charring. I expected some, you know, brown spots. I expected the aft side of the vehicle uh, to have some indication of, you know, significant heating but the vehicle looks just beautiful. It looks pristine, um, and I, I really can't say that enough. It was it was surprising to me um, how well how how good the vehicle looked. Um, so that was that was to me the biggest surprise uh, out of all of it. Um, Yeah, to expand on uh, what Joe just said, um, that's one of the things that going into this mission, uh, an area of the highest uncertainty, you can't really get it from ground tests. You gotta, you gotta fly these missions to, to, uh, confirm is the heating on the aft side. Um, you get some recirculation flow from the hot gases in the plasma and there's a concern that that recirculation can concentrate in a certain area. Um, we will be assessing data for that, but the, the qualitative observation is indeed, like Joe was saying, uh, looks pristine. And uh, our principal investigator, uh, Neil Cheatwood, um, had predicted a lot of these things uh, that we're now seeing. And uh, it's great to see that uh, he was right about so much of it. All right, thank you. We do have a couple um, of press questions in the queue now, so I'll turn it back over to Becca to call on those folks. Our next question comes from Mr. Mike Wall. Your line is not open. You may ask your question. Thank you all for doing this. Mike Wall from, from space.com. Um, just a quick question. If, if you want to scale up to, to say the 20 meter range of, with, with the Hyatt, if, if like that's a legitimate next step, I mean, can you test a vehicle of that size with, with a reentry test? Like, like, yeah, damn, like you did with lofted, are there rockets big enough 
to do that? Or is this just something or, and, and if you can, can you, can you say that that's the next step that you're working toward? Are, are you actively trying to kind of line that up as a next step for the high ed program? Thank you. So if, if it's okay, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, yeah. So, so um, scaling up to, to, you know, 18 to 20 meters is uh, definitely one of the areas that we are looking at. It, it our, our biggest challenge on, um, on the JPSS2 lofted launch, as John mentioned, was we were limited by up mass, we were limited by volume, so we had to scale the um, reentry vehicle to a size that we could fit um, within the, the available up mass and, and volume that JPSS2 was allowing us to have. Um, when it comes to getting to 20, uh, 20 meters, when you start talking about like 18, 20 meters, really what you're talking about is bringing back, say, a Cygnus capsule or, um, or, or one of the elements of the International Space Station. That is something we've looked at in the past, but even then it doesn't quite get to the mass that we really need to demonstrate uh, 20, 20, uh, 18 to 20 meter scale. So, um, you know, when, when the best I think we could do at this point is probably trying to bring back one of the elements of ISS and, or a Cygnus module um, with the, the, say, like one of the orbital missions. Um, and, but even then, we're only going to be able to bring back, you know, 10 to 12 meter scale or test 10 to 12 meter scale. We really need a heavy mass to bring back in order to get to relevant conditions for 18 to 20 meters. Yeah, and so just to add to that, um, and sorry, I'm so excited about this. I like talking about it. But I think your uh, your question was spot on. You, you asked if there's a uh, if there's a rocket or a launch vehicle that is big enough to accommodate an 18 meter or a 22 meter, and that is what's so uh, advantageous about a high ed. We can compact it into any shape, uh, almost any shape. And so we can compact it down into whatever the launch vehicle needs us to fit into. Uh, you know, just take the room that we need to for the packed aeroshell, not the full 18 meters. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from David Curley. Your line is open. Thank you for another question, uh, and I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer two questions, really. Um, scaling sometimes brings challenges. What are the challenges when you want to scale three or four times from your test article? And uh, a lot of you have worked on this for a long time. Can you talk about the arc of the ideas of a high ad? And, and you know, we, we've seen some work, but to get to this this point with the technologies, the fabrics, and everything else, just give me a sense of the bigger picture of that arc. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, I can I can talk to the arc, uh, but then I, I probably want to hand it over to Greg or to John to talk about some of the challenges of scaling, you know, scaling up the technology. As far as the arc, um, we started obviously uh, back in 2003, um, you know, very early on, low, low technology readiness level, doing just very uh, crude and elementary testing in wind tunnels. We, we looked at a wide range of materials, wide range of layups, um, evaluating uh, test facilities. And re in a lot of ways, we were really learning how to actually work with flexible systems, which is what the high technology is, it's a big flexible system. Um, as we've as we've matured over the years, the tools that we use have matured, the material systems have become much more mature, the, um, the construction techniques that are used have become increasingly not just more complex, but much more mature in how we handle materials. And um, so, so when you say the arc of what we're looking at, we have a wide range of upcoming materials that are being fed from our GCD, our ground, uh, our game-changing development uh, 
folks uh, within STMD, the, the, uh, the, um, our stakeholders at, at headquarters, that feed new materials, new, new systems, and new ideas into uh, the higher technology arc, if, if you want to call it that. Um, so we, we are constantly in a state of evaluating new capabilities and materials um, and then developing new methods for uh, verifying uh, material viability for the application that we're using, which is taking a material, compacting it to small volume, and then letting it sit in vacuum for extended periods of time, and then putting it through a giant heat pulse and pressure load uh, during an entry phase. So you take all that together, and, and um, it becomes a big smorgasbord of, of work and ground development that ultimately leads to um, demonstrations like Lofted. I'm not sure if that necessarily answered the question, but I'll, I'll hand it over to John and Greg to talk to uh, either that or, or the, some of the challenges uh, for getting to larger scale. Yeah, and Greg, I think you can speak to this better than I can. Uh, you, so Greg is uh, announced as our instrumentation lead, but he's also an Aeroshell subject matter expert working with uh, Steve Hughes, our Aeroshell lead, and has, uh, has firsthand uh, knowledge on what it takes to manufacture these inflatable structures and flexible thermal protection systems. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there will be challenges. Um, with the six-meter size right now, we do a lot of things uh, just with human force. Um, it's, I mean, a lot of these materials, it's all a soft goods construction. So all these materials are um, alone. A lot of them can be somewhat delicate until they get uh, manufactured into the full assembly. And so one of the things is right now, most things are done by hand. Uh, most things are moved around by hand, things like that. Uh, once we get to these larger scales, we get these larger swaths of material that we're going to be using. And so we're going to have to be careful how we do our assembly to not put added strain onto these materials as we move them around and things like that. Um, so there's a big challenge just in the actual hands-on fabrication um, there's also, you know, material limitations and the width of what we can get. And so some of these um, materials, you know, we have to get a little bit more creative um, how we do our manufacturing processes. And I can't really go into detail there, but we'll have to get a little bit more creative. And we have actually looked at this in the past under the HIAD 2 development camp ground test campaign. Um, we actually built the first three tori of a 12 meter design. So it wasn't a, full 12 meter assembly, but it was the first three tours, which I think came out to about seven or eight meters, somewhere in there. Um, and we, so we'd learned a lot there because those had a section diameter, you know, for lofted, our section diameter was um, for the smaller size of the tours was 15.7. And these other ones had, uh, that we did a while ago were 24 inch minor diameter of the tours. So 24 inch wide tube. Um, and that really experience for us gave us a lot of ideas on how to do these manufacturing steps as we move forward. Um, one of the things is with the ULA Smart Reuse that we're working towards with our partner ULA is um, you know the engine recovery, and that is going to be on the order of that 10 to 12 meter size. So you know that is uh, a near term step that we're working towards. So yeah, and one other thing on that, um, I, I want to introduce RJ Bakken, our reentry vehicle lead. Um, he could probably speak to. There's al there's also challenges associated when you scale up with uh, uh, the inflation gas, so the amount of gas you need to get it into shape and maintain pressure. Um, and we've been looking at developing different ways to inflate uh, aeroshells um, that are beyond what we are using in these uh, in these flight demonstrations, which is a a blowdown system. So, RJ, I don't know if you want to speak to those challenges. Uh, sure, John. Thank you. Um, we've been working with uh, various SBR contracts for a few years, but uh, we've been using blowdown systems because up to now we've not really focused in on uh, some of the support architectures. And when we do our trade studies, looking at humans to Mars and some of these other other uh, commercial uh, entities, uh, we believe gas generators are more efficient from a mass standpoint, from a processing standpoint, 
and we've been trading various gases uh, and how we can store those gases and solids uh, to increase the uh, the mass efficiency and then also remove some of the potential failure modes uh, you know regulators and, and control valves and uh, some of the infrastructure we've used on going back to RV2 and RV3 uh, all the way to lofted and so uh, we're just getting to the beginning of starting to invest in those particular technologies and there's not a lot of existing technologies out there that meet all our requirements. Uh, a lot of them have negatives like high water content or high temperatures, uh, high, high carbon content after uh, after you fire them. So that is an area that we are starting to invest in and uh, is an enabling technology to support the larger scale high ads. Thank you, RJ. Just real quick, I wanted to follow on what Greg was saying earlier about some of the other challenges. Um, if any of you have a tape measure, just go outside, measure out what 12 meters is, measure out a distance of 20 meters. And then um, one of our, our big challenges is that a lot of our facilities and our vendors uh, that we work with um, <clears throat> are gonna end up having to change facilities in order to build articles to the size and scale that, that we need for uh, human access to Mars. So it, it's a, it is a, a challenge for NASA uh, to, to work with vendors and, and to, you know, that, that have worked with us for years to, to develop the technology. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of the next major step. And when you look at 12 meters and 20 meters, if you go outside and you, you do this for yourself, you'll see the facilities that you need to, to, to handle materials and layups and, and systems that large they are huge. So, um, you know, we'll, that's, that's another one of the just physical limitations and constraints that we're going to be working within. Thanks, all. I, we have a couple more questions in the queue, so I think that'll probably be it for today. Um, I do just want to say, since we had RJ answer that for those on the line, that was RJ Bodkin, B-O-D-K-I-N and he is the reentry vehicle lead for Lofted at NASA Langley. All right, Becca, uh, on to the next question, please. The next question comes from Kenneth Ting. Your line is now open. Hi, I hope you can hear me better this time. Um, so one of the you know, people sort of had hesitation about inflatables is worrying that it won't properly inflate or that it'll pop. So I was just wondering, what else do you need to do to sort of demonstrate the reliability this will work basically every time? Thank you. So, John, I'm going to uh, hand this over to you, but I'd like to say something real quick. Um, I had a question very similar to this asked of, of me uh, at a technology day on the Hill many years back uh, from an astronaut asking, do you really think humans should be putting their lives on inflatables? And I, I didn't know who he was at the time, and I kind of very offhanded, uh, snarky comment that came out of my mouth that shouldn't have was, well, why not? I mean, billions of people put their lives on inflatables every day. I mean, that's what the wheels on your car are. So it, it's, um, I don't mean that in quite the facetious way that it came across, but um, the reality is that we use inflatables and inflatable structures um, for, you know, a, a number of, 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 of different applications. And this is just a very specific application uh, for our inflatable systems. John? Yeah, so we do a lot of uh, preparation for um, how to maintain inflation on, of these articles, how to make them uh, as leak tight as possible. Um, and they are incredibly... Uh, resilient and strong materials. Um, one thing I want to uh, clarify is a lot of times we say this is a flexible system and uh, people might walk away with the wrong impression there. It is flexible in the sense that we can deflate it and fold it up and pack it into a smaller uh, diameter for flight. And then, uh, but when it's deployed and when it's pressurized, it is a uh, very rigid structure. 
Um, it does not take too much pressure to make it rigid, but uh, this is not, uh, it, it behaves much more like a rigid heat shield in flight. Um, it's not as flexible as you might think. Uh, the other thing is, um, yeah, I see this as akin to, and this is one of the reasons I'm so excited and just incredibly grateful to our, uh, our team, uh, so many people involved in, in making this a success. Um, this is akin to a parachute. If you're talking about a soft good that uh, handles, uh, you know, missions that include people. Um, and we've demonstrated that over and over again, and parachutes have become very reliable and safe. And uh, that's where we're headed with this. You know, this is this is akin to a first successful parachute test uh, in a different regime, uh, an inflatable heat shield, which if you asked me 10 years ago, I'd be like, that's crazy. But uh, here we are, and it works great. Thank you. Before we go to our last question, which we'll have to answer quickly, um, I just want to give a few closing pieces of information. So uh, first of all, there will be a replay of this call available um, on the phone line, and I will send that information to those of you who are dialed in. Um, for anyone listening, it will also be available at the YouTube link um, that is currently embedded on nasa.gov slash live. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions or interview requests, please feel free to reach out to me, Sarah Frazier, sarah.frazier at nasa.gov. And now I will hand it over to Becca for our last question that we will answer quickly. Our last question comes from Marcia Smith. Your line is now open. Thanks so much for letting me ask a second question. And it's actually two questions, but they're quick. Uh, the first one is, how much did this cost? And the second one is, when you're doing this at Mars, of course, the Mars atmosphere is completely different from Earth's atmosphere. So do you know enough? that you can do it through modeling to know how this is going to perform in the Mars atmosphere, or do you need to do a test first? Yeah, so... so Hi. Um, jo oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Trudy. So I was going to take the first question, and then uh, you all can take the modeling question. So, Marcia, thanks for the, the question. That um, <clears throat> The cost of the lofted project, five-year duration project, was uh, 90, about $93 million. Um, and... Uh, just to clarify, about a third of that was hardware in the $30 million range um, and future uh, versions of high, ed, of high ed, depending on what the application is, we estimate, because you're getting rid of, you know, the non-recurring engineering costs that are in there uh, that you don't need to, to pay for again, uh, we estimate in the, the 2 to $5 million range. So um, I hope that would, was helpful. And then, and Joe, yeah, then if you could take the second question. Yeah, actually, uh, so, so thanks, Judy. Um, as far as the second question is concerned, yes, we, de we definitely know enough about uh, the Martian atmosphere. At the surface of Mars, the atmosphere is about the equivalent of what we have here at Earth at 100,000 feet. As my PI would say, if Mars had any less of an atmosphere, we would say it didn't have one. Um, John, do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Um, so the yeah, this test was a very Mars-like trajectory. Uh, we targeted the upper atmosphere and a shallow flight path angle um, at this velocity and this ballistic number to uh, to simulate what we have uh, analyzed for Mars. So um, it has applications for return to Earth, obviously, and we demonstrated that. But this also has uh, direct application to the environments we see in Mars. About the the only difference would be the species of the gas itself. Uh, the, the chemistry at Earth is different than of the atmosphere at Earth is different than the chemistry of the atmosphere at Mars. But we did fly a very similar trajectory mechanically uh, through the atmosphere. And and just to follow up on that, uh, when we flew Medley and Medley Two, um, we did we did characterize the species of, of gases at Mars. So we're very very aware of what those those chemical species are at Mars. So we and the modeling for that has been um, has been validated. Yeah, correct. Good point, Joe. We 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 know how to account for that. So we have the you know, we'll have this flight correlated data to uh, put into our models, and uh, we will have a very Mars like entry. 
And and let me just clarify on the question. Your first question, uh, Marcia, was was the the ninety three million dollars I quoted to you is that's the NASA side of the cost. It uh, does not include combination with uh, there doesn't include any ULA cost in there. So that was that was strictly NASA. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that is all the time we have for today. So we are going to wrap up here. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. That concludes today's call. You may disconnect at this time.